Welcome to the Visionary Chronicles, a business strategy podcast where we provide insight to those looking for creative, executable strategies built around the latest disruptive ideas, innovative cultures, product creators, and marketing solutions. Today in the Visionary Chronicles, we're going to talk about failure and also success. Previously, we talked about failure, what constitutes failure, and many times it's not clearly understood. Why do some succeed while others fail? And this is a question that has come to me quite a few times through my travels with Liquid Mind, as well as questions that we get on the podcast. And this is a series that we're continuing with our listeners and a question that comes up quite frequently. And while I was a true entrepreneur starting literally with nothing, and building something. And fortunately, after 10 years, uh, which is that threshold of uh, most businesses failing, was able to sell it to a VC firm. So for me, I was very fortunate, but there was a lot of trials and tribulations and going through those 10 years that allowed me to be in a position, maneuvering, pivoting along the way, that allowed me to successfully build, grow, and establish the company. But there are many times companies where the odds aren't in your favor. And that's truly the case with startups. And I like to talk about this because I also not only talk with businesses, I give presentations around the country and I talk to a lot of budding entrepreneurs, ones that have an idea. I call them the idea generators. How do I turn this idea into a profitable business? And it's a lot easier said than done. And I'm going to give you some statistics here. And when you talk about a startup, number one, what is a startup? I mean, when people look at businesses, they see statistics and they talk about franchises versus somebody actually starting a new business. And there is a difference. And there's two characteristics that they qualify for a startup or a new business is one is growth. Growth meaning new opportunity, a new market, a new product. And the second thing is innovation, technology, processes, product, whatever it may be. But that's what constitutes the difference between a startup and a new business. And when you look at that, a great example is, let's say somebody's starting up a franchise business versus somebody building a new franchise business. That effectively is the difference. One is finding a growth and innovation opportunity. The other is expanding upon something that is currently growing and has innovation already. So when you look at the difference, that would be the main difference between those two. But let me give you some statistics just so you can give an idea of where we're at, not only from a, let's say, failure rate, which obviously constitutes and flushes out to the success rate, but also giving an idea of why businesses fail. So it gives you an idea of, through statistics, and this comes from uh, the Business Employment Dynamics Report from 2020. I'm gonna give you some statistics to look at here. But the thing I was digging into here was really, what are the reasons for failure? A lot of people have different reasons, and, and across all boundaries, all companies, all categories, all products, You know, what are those reasons, the most common reasons for failure? And then the other one is how many businesses actually fail? And I've seen a lot of different statistics over the years, but this is truly the statistic that matters is from this study shows that 50% of all businesses fail in the first five years. And 70% of the balance of businesses fail in the next five years. So over that 10 year time frame, nine out of 10 businesses fail. And this doesn't also isn't just in regards to startup businesses. This is also VC backed companies. You know, the other side of this is a startup that has an idea, shows some innovation and potential growth opportunities and early on gets backed by a VC company. So not to make small businesses feel bad, also companies that get backed by these VC companies are eight out of 10 of those fail. So statistically speaking, they're almost the same. 
somebody that goes out on their own, has a technology or a growth opportunity and finds an innovative way, innovative way to bring that to the public through a new product, a market segment, an opportunity that they see in the marketplace that isn't currently in place. So these two statistics from a failure standpoint, I've seen a lot of them thrown around, but it gives you an idea of the state of the industry. And this is across all businesses. So the second point I looked at was, you know, what are the reasons for failure? If we know that nine out of 10 businesses fail in the first 10 years, eight out of 10 VC backed companies fail, fail to give back any amount of money to the VC firms. What are some of the reasons for failure? I've found over the years that many people try to define the reason for failure and why a company did fail. But let's look at the actual top reasons why most startups, companies, and businesses fail, fail to succeed over this first five to 10 years. And the other statistic was within the first year, 20% of all businesses fail. So what are these reasons? And the first reason, which to me is the most logical one, is that that idea for a great product or going after a market segment just wasn't the proper fit. So 34% of all failures are because there's an improper product or market fit. So many ideas that are put into the marketplace or many ideas that are commercialized and put into a channel with competition more often than not either underestimate the competition from a product perspective or underestimate the amount of money that it's going to take to establish that brand in the marketplace. And it's an improper fit for where they're trying to build their revenue from. So by far the largest failure is 34% is product and market fit. So the lesson to take out of this, if you're a startup or if you have an idea is ensure that you thoroughly understand your product advantages in the marketplace, your POD, I call it the point of difference over your competition. And I truly mean taking a deep dive here and having an independent analysis of what you think is a point of difference and have somebody else confirm that for you. And that's what we do many times with Liquid Mind. When we work with companies, we work with brands, they have a new product and everybody falls in love with it within the four walls of the building without any type of independent analysis as to does that hold water in the marketplace if it was actually commercialized and put out there. So product is one for me that I have found not only with the brands I've been with, but also the companies and startups I work with liquid mind product and market fit truly are those areas where people either fall in love with the product or they fall in love with an idea to be able to grab market share from somebody else, either much bigger or a product that's established in the marketplace that they feel that they can grab market share from. So product or market fit is 34% of all failures on small startup businesses. The second one is, interestingly enough, I, I was a little taken back by this one, was the marketing failures. 22% of businesses fail because of marketing failures. And what we mean by that is it could be either budget failures. There are many times where there may be a great digital marketing strategy you need to deploy, but on startups, they're bootstrapped. So this is one where they try to build market share, grow their category, commercialize a product, get it into the market too soon, and many times they don't have the marketing budget to sustain not only the product itself, but more importantly, how do you get the brand name out there through a strategy? So this could be two things. One is a budget. The other is just an improper marketing strategy and how you're going to build and grow that brand. Now, we work with many startup brands as well as globally recognized brands. And many times these startups will ask me, well, how did Adidas or Nike or Oakley establish their brand in the marketplace? And I said that they had a reason for being. They positioned themselves properly first. They defined who they are, what they were going to sell, where they're going to sell it, and who their demographic is 
to a T and they stuck to it day after day after day. Many times on marketing, there's a disconnect between how you're marketing a brand or a product relative to the reality of when it hits the marketplace. So there are many reasons for these failures on marketing, but I found it to be interesting that 22% of all failures are because of marketing. It's a, it's a lesson to all companies that marketing is of primary importance. First, have a great product with a defined point of difference and a market where you can sell it into and be able to grab market share. Now, there are other things that I talk about on the product side and being able to establish market share where there's this thing called leverage. And what I mean by that is that if you have a new apparel product, it doesn't matter how great it is, more often than not, you're gonna get hit with leverage from brands that are already on the retail matrix or brands that already have established position in the marketplace. Now with D to C, what I love about the new environment we're in right now is there's a tremendous amount of flexibility for brands new or old to be able to establish their position in a marketplace on a D to C level. Now that increases the marketing budget. It also increases the strategic side of how you deploy that marketing to ensure that you are getting market share. So D to C opens up this opportunity for many small brands to establish revenue. But the other side of it is that they need to make sure they understand that there's a higher allocation of spend to marketing in order to achieve that revenue goal. The third reason for failure with companies is team and culture issues. And this is 18% of all failures. And this is one where I caution companies on talking about new hires and looking beyond skill set, making sure that there's chemistry between the team and making sure when you interview somebody that they interview with the team, that they interview with people that they're going to be interacting with and and that the people that come into the company or the brand understand the culture that they're walking into. And team and culture fits can also be a failure of a company to effectively manage resources where they're needed in each functional area as a result. If the functional groups aren't getting along, it's a dysfunctional company by design. So making sure that you have the proper team and culture fit is a big area to ensure the long-term success of your brand or company startup all the way through growth of the company. So 18% of all failures are relative to team and culture issues. And many people don't even think about that, which is interesting when you look at the dynamics behind the company and what goes on behind the scenes. So team and culture issues, making sure you get people involved in the very beginning and the people that are coming in before they join understand what they're walking into and how this company is positioned and how they fit with the overall team and culture of that brand. The fourth side of failure is the fourth reason rather is that there's a financial issue, 16%. And I would be willing to, to bet that most people thought that financial issues were a much larger percentage but it's actually only 16% of failures. So going through product market fit, number one, marketing failures, number two, team culture, number three, financial issues are number four. So we know the financial issues that startups come across, they usually cost two to three times more or even exponentially more than founders or startups ever thought in order to build and grow their company. And when we're working with startups, we wanna make sure on the PL side in the financial structure that they understand truly, realistically, and expectation-wise that it's going to cost you a lot more than you anticipate, so be prepared. You always like to have money in the bank, and it's better to have more than not enough because then all you're doing is throwing good money after bad, and you need to make sure you're planning for that before you start up your company. So 16% of all failures over that time frame is relative to financial issues. The fifth, which falls down the chart a little bit here, is actually technology. So infrastructure-wise, technology, I think what you're going to see over the years on the failure side is going to be more pronounced because more companies are reliant on technology. And if you don't have the proper infrastructure and the, and the proper dynamics behind the company to implement technology 
that is meaningful for the company and has a metric dashboard of an ROI and people can understand how to utilize that to make their life easier, to make them more efficient and more effective. It's just a technology that you're funding with no intended purpose. So technology itself needs to be integrated into the company and the brand where it makes sense with those that actually need the technology and have it vertically integrated into the entire business as a whole and make it complementary to the vertical integration of the company and those utilizing a specific technology. And I've seen many failures with companies where they try to implement the latest technology, but the legacy systems don't go away and it never gets fully implemented. As a matter of fact, it's a measure of failure, not success. The last two are operations, which is 2%, and legal issues, 2%. So you can see here, again, reiterating, what are the reasons for failure? The top reasons are product market fit, marketing failures, team culture issues, finance, technology, operations, and legal issues. So those are the top issues as to why business fails. So then what I looked into is some of the other areas that are more macro in nature. These were more micro specific items that kind of compile on top of one another. There could be one reason, there could be multiple reasons, but those are the reasons that businesses fail. And the other side of it is expectations versus realization, I call it. Many owners or startups go into a business with an expectation of success as opposed to the realization of potential failure. So a couple items I looked at was startups take two to three times longer to validate. And what I mean, and I, the, re, the word I love there is validate. And not that you don't think you have a great idea, but others need to adopt that great idea or product. And it just takes them longer to adapt to what you're selling in the marketplace that has a point of difference and you need to ensure that it does get validated. So the realization is that it takes two to three times longer to validate. So that also falls into line with the investment of time and money into a company and the expectation of how long it usually takes a company to become successful. And many times that is through validation in the marketplace, which does take longer. And this is another interesting one as well. When you're starting up a company, what I found is that you pivot. And most people think you pivot a lot, but the brands that I've worked with or I work for at Liquid Mind, what they do is they get into a market or they have a product and they find that there's another segment that works better than the original one they had intended. And that's called pivoting. And pivoting is a, a great opportunity to move into something. And most brands that are successful, interestingly enough, will pivot one to two times. Where it becomes even more interesting is those that fail pivot more than two times. So it's okay to pivot, just not that frequently. So the statistics show most brands that are successful do pivot. Pivot one to two times, more than two times, then they become unsuccessful in building their market or gaining market share. Now, the other area I looked at was what industries are the highest failure rates? So when you're looking at, just out of curiosity, which segments that you're looking to get into or that you're currently in, what do those failure rates look like? And interestingly enough, I think this is just relative to the number of businesses getting into it, but the number one failure rate for industries is information, technology industries that they're looking to establish a new software platform, a services, a SaaS, whatever it may be, or 63% of those fail. The second is retail, 53% of those fail. And I think Unfortunately, in the state of our economy right now, I think that number will actually go up significantly higher. Manufacturing is 51%, wholesale business 46%, and real estate 42 I put the main businesses here. There's a lot more that uh, they had in the study, but I thought these are the most relevant to 
our audience and, and those who are currently in the businesses they're in or ones that may be thinking of an idea this more often than not is what they're looking to get at. Um, and then why such a high failure rate? In the areas that we looked at and what I look at and what this study looked at was startups are really at the end of the day an experiment. And again, they have two characteristics, innovation and growth. And a new business is defined as a new product, category, or service. And it is different, as I'd mentioned earlier, as a franchise or an ongoing business such as a hair salon. It may be a new business, but it ne does not necessarily mean it's a new startup. And there is a point of difference there. Both are extremely difficult to build successfully. It's just one's a little harder than the other because they're building a new product, they're building a new category and trying to get into something that currently does not exist. And so that experiment, when you have an increase in innovation, there's obviously an increase in failure. And that's where those two separate one another. Uh, when you talk about a franchise versus a, a new business, there's usually innovation in this new startup through product, technology, services, platform, whatever it happens to be. And, and as a result, through that increased innovation risk, there's obviously a high failure rate. So there's a direct correlation between new businesses, increased innovation, and the failure rates. So the other question is, you know, why do these VC firms continue to invest in these companies. I think it's interesting for our audience to know and working with VC and PE companies, you know, and I asked that question to them as well. And they balance the odds out from a revenue perspective. So if nine out of 10 fail, that one that hits more often than not will take care of all the losses from the other nine, believe it or not, or else you wouldn't have VCs in business anymore. So clearly that formula works. And one that's a saving grace to small companies is that they're willing to take risk on an idea, on an innovation, on something that looks very promising because of how their structure and model works. So eight out of 10 VC-backed companies fail and they never get their money back. But it's the one out of, or two out of 10 that they bet their money on that's going to outstrip all the losses that they've had from the previous eight or nine. So all in all, when I look at this, kind of I wanted to give you the context of, you know, why do some businesses fail and why do some businesses succeed? So I went through with you kind of the statistics around how many fail over the first five, 10 years, giving you the characteristics of what constitutes a new business and also then the reasons for failure and some of those expectations versus the realization, you know, expectations of success versus the realization of failure. Um, you know, and failure is not final. And for me, I went through many instances and stages in my company where I felt we were on the verge of failure. And you just need to hold true to where your opportunities are and build a strategy and execute against that strategy effectively and efficiently and making sure that your realization matches your vision. So when I looked at this, I looked at a couple points that small businesses, startups should look at. The realization of what you're getting into or maybe what you're already in. And the first realization I looked at was, except you're probably gonna be wrong. The odds are not with you. So it's many times I've been working with companies or startups where they just see the writing on the wall and they refuse to read it. So the realization that you're going to be wrong. Now you could be right and that's absolutely worth the risk. I'm just saying the realization in most instances you're going to be wrong. But it's worth the risk of being right and the statistics showing on VC companies are willing to take that risk as well to say, hey, 80 out of 90% of the time, I'm probably going to be wrong, but I'm willing to bet 10, 20% that I'll be right and it'll make up for what was wrong. So point one I'm saying on the realization is accept that you're probably going to be wrong, but that shouldn't discourage you from starting up your company. It should just be a realization that you have to face each day. 
and making sure you have a strategy to overcome that. The second is it's okay to pivot. It's okay to pivot, but no more than two times. I'm just saying, statistically speaking, those that pivot more than twice are more likely to fail than those that pivot one to two times. Because if you go too many times on pivoting, and I've seen it, is you really need to never get a strategy that you're holding on to that's a heritage of the brand and the culture of the brand. If it's constantly changing, nothing stays the same. So you want to make sure you get anchored on something at some point, and too many pivots allow business to fail. The third point I'll make is never underestimate value. And that could be with a startup as well as an ongoing business. More often than not, when you're sitting in the four walls and and listening to people talk about their ideas and how great they think it is, and you'll ask them, what's your point of difference? Well, it's a value creator. Well, don't overestimate that value creator until it has been proven in the marketplace. And I say validated. So make sure that you understand. And that's why it's so important on the front end to ensure that point of difference is validated before you start overestimating the value of what you have versus your competitor. And the fourth point I'll make is expect it to take longer than you had planned. This is a very logical one for anybody with an idea, a startup, an ongoing business. I'm sure they all look back and say, wow, that took more money than I thought. And it took longer than I thought. And also, the idea I had wasn't as unique as I thought. So those are just realities. And I always like to make sure that having been through it myself, I started with a penny and and built it into a dollar. And so I started from the grounds up. So I, I realized what these entrepreneurs or yourself may be going through. I just want to put statistics out there and the reality of the situation on industries, why businesses fail and give you some words of wisdom in in, in regards to the realization of what you're up against. If you know what you're up against, you can break down barriers. It's when you don't know what you're up against that the barriers take you down. And I'd just like to leave you with a couple quotes from that, that I find reassuring in times of failure or adversity. And the first one is from Napoleon Hill, where he has said, Every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it a seed of an equal or greater benefit, meaning that learn from not only mistakes, but learn from your successes. And Abraham Lincoln that said, my great concern is whether, not whether you have failed, but whether you are content with your failure. So get up once you get knocked down, start punching again, be strong, have thick skin. Make sure that that's always front and center with you when you're building your company. And Bill Gates, who said, it's fine to celebrate success, but it's more important to heed the lessons of failure. So all of these things we look at on failure, and I mention them because I went through failures as well, and everybody has gone through failures. Those who have not are either liars or they've never tried anything at risk. So failure is not final. So continue building, growing your business, have that great idea. Just make sure you plan properly and that you have a realization of failure, but an expectation of success. Would like to thank you for listening to the Visionary Chronicles today. I really appreciate your time. And hopefully you've enjoyed the subjects that we talk about each week here on the Visionary Chronicles. And we feel it's very important. We understand that there's professional needs and support you need with your companies and with your brands, but we also appreciate the fact that you've got some personal needs. As leaders of companies and brands, there are many things that you have to deal with, and we wanna make sure that we're addressing those as well. If you like what you hear, we would really appreciate subscribing to The Visionary Chronicles are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, and Podbean. So we would really appreciate if you'd subscribe and and look forward to bringing additional episodes to you each week. So again, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Look forward to the next podcast.